Okay, so we have another Urbana, Illinois person here. Dr. That's where Dr. Stice, Stice did his training. And he then went, he then became homegrown in Massachusetts. He went to Massachusetts then to take a PhD in animal science and uh, was in the same department at least as Jose Sabelli was. And then Steve became, there, there was an interesting faculty person at uh, UMass that I'm not sure everybody's aware of, and his name was Jim Robel. And Jim Robel was, is one of the people who early on figured out that you could fund basic science in your laboratory by venture capital money if you knew how to do it. And so Jim actually started a company called Advanced Cell Technology, and this is how he was funding basic science research in his laboratory. <clears throat> the University of Massachusetts didn't handle this arrangement as nearly as well as, and Steve can tell us a lot more about that. But at some point, Advanced Cell Technology became more than UMass could handle, became its own company, and uh, Steve Stice became uh, the Chief Scientific Adv Officer for Advanced Cell Technology. Now, Steve's background, we have two <clears throat> very interesting groups in this room this today. We've got some spinal cord people. But we also have some real pioneers in animal, in, in animal cell differentiation. And Jose Sabelli cloned the first transgenic cow, and Steve Stice cloned the first rabbit. And that seems kind of an odd background for a spinal cord workshop, but in fact, it is the very basic science behind dedifferentiation that forms the basis for trying to create patient-specific uh, stem cells, which we're gonna hear about a little bit later. So Steve spent a little time in industry. He was with Advanced Cell Technology for a while. He then went to a company called American Breeders Service, and he was recruited to the University of Georgia um, in about 2001. And I think they were lucky to get him. He has a very unique background now, and he's done a lot for stem cell science, both around the country and certainly here. And Steve is now director of the Regenerative Bioscience Center. So Steve has come a long way from cloning rabbits to now being our host for this spinal cord workshop, which I think is the reason we're getting together today, because this field has matured to the point where we can meld these two sciences and hope make some real progress. So Steve. Thank you, and I um, appreciate the uh, introduction. Uh, there are a couple things uh, that uh, I should uh, clarify there. You know, so we were cloning rabbits in, in when I was a graduate student in uh, Jim Robles' lab, so I was one of the first uh, graduate students, and, and Jose is much younger than me, and he came uh, later than that. Uh, so, uh, and we worked together on cloning uh, um, cattle together. Uh, well, I was a chief scientific officer at Advanced Cell Technology, but uh, the one the clarification is, you know, why why would you clone rabbits? They they seem to to do pretty well <laughs> on the, on the road, uh, type of thing. So, uh, it was, uh, and, but uh, I think that's one of the remaining questions that I have from my graduate degree is uh, why would you clone them? But uh, it was a time interesting time in the field. Um, and that was back in 1987 when we did that work, and and uh, when my it was an interesting time in my life when we had uh, my wife and I had twins uh, at that time. So I got accused of taking my work home with me at night, um, but uh, it all turned out well, and, and we're we're here today. And um, cloning has had a lot of contribution to the field of, of stem cells. Obviously, we know about uh, some of the the work that goes on between the, the two areas, but you know, Jamie Thompson came from, a, a, he's a veterinarian degree, and, and a lot of the early stem cell work, I think, happened because people were working in animal stem cells, pig and bovine stem cells like Jose and myself, uh, and not in the mouse, which was a very different system than, than the human, so um, again, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Anne for putting this all together and, and uh, uh, the invitation and, and the uniform ties today. I know a few of, we ha of them have the uh, stem cell ties on today, so uh, I'm much appreciated for, for doing this. Um, you know, why, why the University of Georgia, uh, why come all the way to Athens, Georgia to do this? And, and you're not the first ones uh, this week to have, have made the journey here. Uh, we had um, earlier in the week, we had the last five 
uh, U.S. Secretary of State here at the University of, of Georgia to talk about uh, the state of disrepair in uh, our foreign policy. And I guess I think the majority of us in this room would probably say there's a state of disrepair in, in uh, NIH funding as well. So we're, we're continuing along those, uh, that theme. Um, you know, we, we, what the 800-pound uh, gorilla in here is funding, uh, and we need to address that uh, for this area. And uh, we're not going to get much further with, without additional funding. I was out in San Francisco uh, earlier this week, and, and California does have it right in many ways, and that uh, they are putting their money where their mouth is and, and uh, getting things done there. So I applaud that work and, and hope that uh, that can serve as a model um, for the rest of the states. And, and uh, so, um, you know, that I want to get into my talk, but I also want to just say that, you know, I have two reoccurring uh, nightmares that I have, and one is being caught in a public place without my clothes. Uh, and, and the second one is that my PowerPoint presentation doesn't work, the projector doesn't work. So I lived through one of those nightmares today uh, with the projector, and so I apologize for not having the, the system uh, put together and, and so that uh, you can have two screens, but hopefully it'll, it'll work out all right. Uh, as Ann was saying, I, I, I do come from uh, an interest in both the academic and the industry side. Uh, we, um, we, we did quite a bit of work at Advanced Cell Technology on the cloning and stem cell area, and, and Jose took over a lot of that work when, when I left. Uh, but, um, you know, there is, uh, when I came here, we started up a company called Cytogenesis, and then that, that merged with Breezygen, and our hopes was to produce stem cells for Parkinson's disease. And we, early on, uh, did take the advice and, and went to uh, the FDA and talked about uh, cell therapies for Parkinson's disease. We, um, we had, re at ACT, we developed uh, cloned uh, cattle embryos as a source of ventral mesencephalon cells uh, that could be transplanted into uh, humans. And the thought was, yeah, we can make genetic modifications, we can stem some of the uh, immune rejection issues by some of these uh, genetic modifications. We were very naive at that time uh, at advanced cell technology, and then the mad cow disease issues come up, and obviously uh, they're not going. Nobody's going to put uh, bovine cells in. So we really turned to um, to uh, to embryonic stem cells, human embryonic stem cells. When I got here, at, at um, uh, after I was at advanced cell technology, to come here to work with Breezygen to derive new stem cell lines, and and it's not known by many people, but um, Wisconsin, California, and University of Georgia, Breezygen were the first three places that derived uh, human embryonic stem cells, and we have three of our lines on the NIH uh, registry. Uh, and back in the middle of 2001, you get a phone call from the White House asking if you have stem cells in your lab, and that, that's, a, that's an eye-opening and a scary uh, experience, but in, in the end, uh, it all worked out well. And those cell lines are valuable. Um, you know, a lot of people complain about the, the issues, and I'm not here to, to defend anything other than to say that by limiting it only to some 20 cell lines, those cell lines are very highly characterized. And so the more is known about uh, those cell lines than if you had hundreds of cell lines that everybody was working on. And, and I do think there are differences uh, between cell lines, and you can, with the culture systems, make some, some big changes. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, the Breezygen of, uh, experience taught me one thing, and that was when we went to the FDA and said we want to do uh, cell therapy in Parkinson's disease, and uh, they said, great, we want to help. Uh, but uh, we, we want the following type of things, and, and uh, that was, well, the, the recent study came out from Kirk Fried's lab that fetal cells could be transplanted, but in some cases they saw some complications. So we want you to 
derive cells that are uniform um, and consistent, robust, and then we want to, you to do three arms uh, or uh, uh, sequentially where you give a subclinical dose, a clinical dose, and then a high dose. And sequentially was a big issue there because uh, we want you to follow those patients out for a couple years afterwards from each of those and uh, you do the math fairly quickly you find out you're doing a, a 15 year phase one phase two uh, clinical trial for Parkinson's disease and then on top of that you want to do a subclinical dose where you put in four needle tracks into uh, uh, into the midbrain and getting an IRB to approve a a subclinical dose for such an invasive uh, procedure as that. I mean, there are a lot of issues uh, going to clinical trials, and um, I'm very interested in hearing what happens in, in April. I, I understand there's an open uh, meeting with the FDA about some of the new stem cells uh, that are maybe going into clinical trials. So um, hopefully uh, they had better luck than, than Brisagen did at, at uh, uh, going in that route. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to really drill down more towards the cell side of things. I'm not a clinician and um, I don't pretend to say, know much more than what I just told you about the, uh, the clinical side of things. Uh, but I do think based on that experience that uh, there's some things that we need to do and to get the research done, we need a better system uh, than we have today with embryonic stem cells. Uh, embryonic stem cells uh, are a colony like this of, of human embryonic stem cells that were cultured on a mouse feeder layer, and I'm sure uh, uh, Hans is going to talk about some of the, the ways of getting around some of these issues. Uh, but uh, the great thing about embryonic stem cells is that they turn into all different cell types. The Achilles heel of embryonic stem cells is they like to turn into all these different cell types and controlling those cells is very problematic. So uh, a lot of the work and still today uh, in stem cell labs is just trying to maintain and culture these human embryonic stem cells. And so there's a lot of, of and, work that goes into that and then trying to do an experiment on top of that really makes it a, a very difficult field to, uh, to make a lot of progress fast. But uh, there are ways of getting past that and I'm going to propose uh, one of those possibilities today. So we were able to, uh, to get uh, our human embryonic stem cells uh, to go towards a a, uh, a motor neuron fate, and this is work that was done by uh, Su Zhang Shin in my lab and was published in 2005. Um, the, these are two positive cells in red, and then I let one positive cells. And yes, we can get uh, cells that look like motor neurons uh, in a petri dish, you know, then going to a clinical. Uh, phase with any cell type like this is obviously a, a huge step and what I want to talk about is some of the things that we can do in between with these cells that might lead to better clinical uh, outcomes as well. So uh, this process of going from human embryonic stem cells that are difficult to maintain and then going to motor neurons or other cell types often takes four to five weeks of culture uh, in a petri dish, and that's just a lot of work that's that's difficult to, to do. So there, there's got to be better ways uh, of, of doing the research uh, and moving the research uh, faster uh, towards clinical trials. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about some of these issues uh, during the next 30 minutes or so. Um, one of the big issues and has already been uh, talked about is, you know, we can't get, we can't have tumors. Uh, and one of the issues is, you know, yeah, the culture systems are going out for extended periods of time, but you're starting with embryonic stem cells and uh, you're doing a lot of things to them. At the end, do you really have uh, normal cells? And the normal in the sense that I'm going to talk about is, are they karyotypically normal? Uh, in, in, 
and do some of the things that we do to propagate these cells, uh, make changes in those cells. And so I think some of the things that have been published in the literature where we do see uh, tumor formations, uh, teratomas, may be the, uh, a result of the fact that maybe we're putting in uh, not karyotypically normal uh, cells. Um, obviously, to, to go into clinical trials, you need consistent source and a robust source. I mean, we can't just get a couple cells and you get images of people putting up, well, here's a motor neuron or, or here's an oligodendrocyte. I mean, you need to really get a, a high volume and robust system, and I think we'll hear more about that later with uh, Hans's work as well. And then, you know, we need to also think about functional um, potential of these cells, and I, I think that's something we can address you know, with some of the in vitro assays, but obviously in, in the end we're going to have to go to in, in vivo assays. Um, easy to, live, to, to deliver, um, one of the things that uh, I'm very interested in is, is maybe not having to do that invasive um, for needle tracks for Parkinson's disease or, or to direct injections of those cells at the site of injuries. Uh, can we think about how these cells might be able to migrate to sites of, of injury and, and help in the outcome um, without putting the, the patients at, at, at high risk? And the, the issue that I'm not going to talk about, and, and, but I think is, is still very much an issue that needs to be addressed and, and isn't adequately, adequately addressed today is, you know, are these cells uh, being rejected? Um, a lot of the work from the fetal cell transplants, the human fetal cell transplants into humans uh, uh, for Parkinson's disease uh, and other models uh, suggests that 80, 90 percent of the cells that are injected are, don't survive, whether that's the injection process or an immune, uh, acute uh, immune response to those cells when injected. Uh, to get those dosing effects um, when you were, were trying to go at, at different doses, if you get variability at one time you're going to get uh, you know, only 10 percent of the cells to survive in the next patient or next uh, 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 project, you get 50% to survive, uh, that becomes a real issue. And so we need to have a consistent way of getting these cells to survive uh, when they're placed in, in either animals and, and in, in humans in the end. So uh, I'm going to talk about the potential solution, and I don't want to overplay this uh, too much, but uh, we've been able to derive some um, uh, very robust progenitor cells that uh, will help people do the research we think uh, to get to some of these answers uh, faster and, uh, and, and a lot easier. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we have a NIH fun, uh, grant to put on a workshop that's coming up in May. Uh, to help people grow human embryonic stem cells. And it's a five-day course, and it's five days is just long enough to get people totally frustrated in growing human embryonic stem cells. Uh, so if you're an, a neural uh, biologist and want uh, the robust nature of human embryonic stem cells without some of the problems, I think we're, there are solutions uh, out there, and I'm going to talk about that. But first, let's, let's just talk a little bit about the normal cells that we want to put in uh, these uh, patients in the end. Um, we published this work in Nature Biotechnology a couple years ago, but uh, there was, you know, in the past, many people working in, in mouse cells and other cells really didn't pay a lot of attention to um, some of the abnormalities that might occur during culture systems. Uh, uh, and we found that under certain conditions, we actually get some really big problems in that uh, if you culture embryonic stem cells out for long periods of time under very um, clonal, clonal systems without feeder layers and in our hands, uh, you can easily get uh, trisomies at 12 and 17 uh, very early on. Um, you can also get trisomies at, at um, you can get extra X chromosomes as well as uh, at the 
tw chromosome 20 as well. Okay. So it's a, uh, what we've figured it out to be is that uh, what the issue is that once the, there are some genes, something on those tri um, chromosomes that they have a, the stem cells that are trisomies at those levels have some added benefit in culture in that they grow faster, they're, they maintain themselves a phenotype of an embryonic stem cell, uh, and they're easy to grow. So we're actually in our culture systems selecting for a cell that's, that's easily propagated and grows um, uh, fairly undifferentiated until you want to turn them into something else. So it's, it's great and, uh, to work with these cells, uh, but you have to know that you're going to have trisomies at, at 12 and 17, and there are going to be uh, issues around that. So uh, uh, I tell graduate students and postdocs in my lab that once you're, when they come in, once your cells start growing, you, have a, you don't have problems anymore, and you can maintain them, and they do great in culture, it's time to throw them away because they're, uh, they're probably trisomy at that period of time. But I don't think this is, this is adequately addressed today. And maybe, in fact, the reason why we're seeing some of the issues around tumor formation with some of these embryonic stem cell uh, 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 transplantations. Um, and I, I just put that out as a possibility and, and maybe provocative statement in that we found out that uh, when we put ter uh, cells, and this is uh, in a uh, uh, non-skid mice, that we put uh, our embryonic stem cells in the leg uh, muscle there, and you get these very complex uh, teratomas form uh, in these animals uh, quite easily. Um, so that, you know, you get all three germ layers and they, they become very complex. What we found when we put in uh, teratomas from these abnormal human embryonic stem cells that may be uh, trisomy at 12 and 17, uh, you get a very different uh, set of structures forming in that they're very cystic, more simplistic uh, uh, in their histology. I don't, sorry, I don't have a histology slide to show you, but they also move around and, uh, and you might consider metastasize as well, and that they, we found them in all the different organs uh, within these animals as well. So they're, they're very opportunistic and then metastasize. So, you know, the, maybe in some instances that where we're, uh, people have seen uh, higher rates of tumor formation when they transplanted these cells, um, this may be a cause. And I, I was, as I said, I was at a stem cell meeting last week and somebody put up, I'm not going to tell who, but they put up a slide and said, you know, we put these cells into a, a rat model for, for Parkinson's disease and in fact uh, we did see these big tumors and I asked about what cells you were working with and they were working with these variant cell lines that are sold by uh, in vitrogen uh, right now, and and uh, uh, and I think that may be a problem. They're easy to work with, uh, but they may give you abnormal results because of their abnormal in, in uh, karyotype. So um, I'm going to leave that now, just and and say that you know this is something that we have to be very careful as we move forward in translating. So the. Uh, the, the stem cell field, very early on in 2001, there were two groups, uh, Rubinoff's group and Zhang's group, that were able to isolate a neural uh, uh, lineage with, from embryonic stem cells. Um, two different processes, but in the end, what they, they, they did is use these neural spheres or, or embryonic-derived uh, neural spheres to derive the neurons, astrocytes, and possibly oligodendrocytes as well. And uh, it's a very complex process. Um, the thing that uh, we noticed when we tried to repeat these uh, processes in a three-dimensional system in suspension in these neural spheres is that you get very complex uh, neural spheres and that you can get, this is MAP2 uh, staining for neurons, uh, but you get all kinds of cells, undifferentiated cells, the neuroprogenitor cells that you start with, 
as well as other cell types with growing in these embryo bodies and, and very difficult to work with. So it was our thought that really if we want a consistent, robust cell source, that in the end we're going to need to get away from uh, embryoid bodies and get a very um, uh, consistent source of cells. So we, we, and we know that in, uh, when we want to go to clinics, clinical trials with something like this, yes, you could have a complex process and then put in a gene to select out certain cells. Well, you know, that just level, adds another level of oversight. And so what we need to do is go as far as we can with, uh, without genetic ma manipulation to get a functional uh, neuron in the end. And so what we've done is, is gone from embryonic stem cells to a, a neural progenitor cell type and in our hands and, and uh, the small company that we have, we can grow up uh, billions of these cells now uh, that have the ability to differentiate into uh, neurons and, and other cell types. And so just as part of a disclosure, those cells are, are available at, at Millipore um, and it's our hope again that you people that don't want to work with and fuss with embryonic stem cells but still want that uh, potentiality of embryonic stem cells can work with these and, and uh, develop some, some new treatments for uh, uh, neurological diseases. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that process and what we wanted to, to, to accomplish with that process. Obviously we want a stable karyotype, maintain them for multiple passages so that we can grow up uh, billions of these cells, grow them obviously without feeder cells and, and the problems that feeder cells uh, present. Uh, we think adherent monolayers are the way to go and obviously they need to differentiate into neural cells and, and glial cells and be able to form a multiple neural phenotypes. And the resulting tissue or cells should form a reasonable model for the developing nervous system. So not only for cell therapies in the future, but uh, also for, uh, as a test bed for uh, developing new compounds that might be, um, again, neuroprotective or neural repair strategies that uh, go beyond just the cell therapy um, uh, angle. So what we do, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but again, we start with these complex embryonic stem cells and through a, a process of uh, changing, changes in media, it's a serum-free uh, media process, it's an adherent system where we uh, remove the, uh, oh, sorry, go back here, uh, remove the uh, fibroblast feeder cells, uh, we isolate these uh, neural rosettes uh, on a, uh, a laminin-coated uh, slides, uh, we maintain and characterize these cells and we've gone out months and months now of, um, of propagation of these cells uh, in our lab. And they are stable, um, adherent, uh, characterized neural progenitor cells. So if you want more details on it, we published this um, in 2006. Um, and, but I'd be glad to give you more information if you're interested in. And we've late now gone into other cell types um, whether uh, in the vasculature as well as germ cells, basically on this premise that adherent cells on, on uh, laminin may be a, a great way to go about doing that. Uh, so back to our neural progenitor cells, one of the things we wanted to obviously eliminate any leftover embryonic stem cells, the OCT4 positive cells, and we've done that in our cultures of neural progenitor cells, they're negative for OCT4. Um, they're also positive for Nestin um, and SOX2 um, and we've been able to get uh, as far as Nestin over 90% uh, of these cells, 95% and higher, uh, are positive for, for Nestin. So we, we think we have a very um, uh, consistent source uh, of cells to go forward with in our, our systems. Um, just to mention some of the early studies and very preliminary studies with these cells is that uh, through a collaboration with Michelle LaPlaca at, at Georgia Tech, we have transplanted these neural progenitor cells into a rat contusion model um, in her lab and uh, the cells 
Um, these neural progenitor cells do uh, take up space. Uh, the green is the uh, obviously human uh, nuclear antigen. I'm sorry the projector is not projecting well, but um, these are uh, these cells do differentiate into more mature neural phenotypes uh, when you do the histology later. So going further into these studies, and we've got some other um, uh, ideas to to uh, to work out with these cells. But in in our hands, at least uh, to date, uh, we're not getting uh, the the teratoma formation with these neural progenitor cells, and I think that's uh, maybe one of the biggest positives that we can say uh, about these cells today. Uh, these cells, if you look at them with a scanning EM on the laminin, they, they do shoot out a lot of projections, philopodia, uh, um, and they are actually very, very mobile cells. Uh, if you look under time lapse of these cells on, uh, on laminin coated slides, uh, they move around uh, very highly migratory uh, cell types. Um, you have to grow them at high densities. Um, so that uh, they'll proliferate. Um, they're very promiscuous cells. They like to go around and touch each other uh, a lot. And, uh, but we're hoping that in the end, a, uh, a cell type like this that's highly migratory, uh, at least in vitro right now, might translate in vivo as well as being highly migratory and that maybe you don't have to inject cells in the future into the direct site of the injury and maybe you can do it over longer periods of time uh, in order to get a, a, a therapeutic outcome. But obviously that, that's, that's room for research in that area. So uh, injecting them into uh, IV, um, there is a lot of data out there to suggest that neural stem cells can in fact go uh, into various parts of the, the uh, body and even into the uh, CNS as well. Uh, so we're, we're hopeful that these cells might do the same. And whether they repair or provide growth factors or, or whatever uh, they do, they, they'd have some ability to uh, be supportive. So we, we've taken these neural progenitor cells and I said we can uh, proliferate these cells. Um, there are a lot of groups out there that have worked out the systems in the mouse to inject uh, or induce um, motor neuron phenotype using sonic hedgehog and retinoic acid, uh, basically following those leads and adding these for about a week period. They undergo an induction process and then we get some differentiation towards neural phenotypes and glial cells as well. And that's um, something that we published in, in uh, 2005. Um, you know, it, it's, it's great uh, that we can do that, but they are mixed populations of cells. And so if we're wanting to use these cells and wanting to, to direct them to a particular phenotype, uh, maybe we need to go beyond these new, uh, neural progenitor cells and get a neural motor neuron uh, progenitor cell. And we've done a little bit of work in that um, as well. And uh, one of the things that uh, would be great if you could, uh, again, exposure to retinoic acid, basic FGF, sonic hedgehog, be able to get some of the markers that are present in motor neurons, whether it's PAC6 to HOLIG2 um, uh, markers, sorry, uh, and then go from there to the, the more mature uh, motor neurons in, in culture as well. I mean, in the end, it's probably, you know, the idea of connecting the CNS through uh, transplanting motor neurons back is is a far out uh, process, but if you could get uh, motor neuron progenitor cells, uh, there, there might be potential for something like that. And, and we've found that in our, our system that, uh, that really uh, basic FGF is the, the driver towards those, those phenotypes. It's not only um, a, a mitogen in our culture, but it also causes a, a, a significant portion of these to start expressing oleg 2 uh, If you add um, uh, retinoic acid and sonic hedgehog on top of that, you do get uh, increased expression of, of those particular genes as well. Uh, as 
again, uh, we're able to get uh, the PAC6 express, uh, expression in OLEG2 to some extent. Uh, whether we can get a stable motor neuron progenitor cell type is still yet to be determined, uh, but we're, uh, oh, we'd like to work on that area. And in, and in the end, um, get motor neurons uh, for various applications. Um, and again, you know, candidates cells for cell therapy, are they this, the spinal cord, for, for spinal cord injury, are they the NP cells or are they uh, a more uh, advanced cell type or even a different cell type is yet to be determined. One of the things, and, and Ravi uh, Balakanda is, is going to be talking on the panel this afternoon, but uh, one of the things that we, we hope to work on together is, is this idea that, you know, I told you that certain growth factors uh, may push cells down a particular uh, lineage. Uh, what would be neat is if you could take uh, neural stem cells, neural progenitor cells, and a slow release of a neurotrophic factor uh, together at, uh, and in this case, uh, Ravi and I are interested in putting it into severed uh, sciatic nerve and in a micro environment that can produce neural, no, I mean, new neuromuscular junctions. And the, the idea is that, you know, if we can reconnect to the, the muscle cells with these cells that um, by electrical stimulation could affect uh, the muscle by stimulating the transplanted cells in the periphery to elicit uh, muscle excitation. So really not reconnecting the CNS to it, but uh, through uh, uh, engineering and the mechanical and electrical stimulation, be able to regain uh, function of certain muscle cells. And, and uh, that, of course, would be of, of interest to some uh, groups that are just interested in, in uh, bowel um, uh, function again. Uh, in the, in the therapy area. So I'm, in just the last couple minutes, I wanted to just briefly touch on, you know, drug discovery area. So, I, you know, area of, of uh, cell therapy is, is important, uh, but can we use these cells as a test bed for drug discovery as well? And, and there's a long list of, of diseases that might, uh, you might go after, and, and I think uh, spinal cord injury is probably one that hasn't been addressed as well as it should, and I, I think there, there are opportunities there. Um, right now, um, our, our small company is dr screening drugs for um, uh, AMPA potentiators, which would be a cognitive enhancer for Alzheimer's and, and schizophrenia, and I'll talk about a possibility for, for pain as well. So in order to do that, you need to be able to get a robust uh, uh, early neurons at least to try and do some of these, these testing on, of these, uh, these compounds. And, and we've been able to do that in a 96 well format. And Dave Mahashek, who's, who's here today from Aruna Biomedical, uh, has been working on this um, uh, for the last uh, year or so, and, and we do have a nice assay system for uh, a compound screening uh, today in our lab. And uh, because we have a robust uh, uh, way of getting these cells. Uh, in the future, obviously, to, to direct cells, and in, in whether it's um, uh, in the peripheral nervous system or in the uh, uh, CNS. Uh, being able to look at neurite outgrowth and morphology would be very important. Um, we've got people working on this. This is an image from Jenny Muma's uh, work on this. Um, but the idea of being able to take cells and immediately plate them down on a, uh, on a Petri dish and then screen for compounds that might direct these neurite formations or extend these neurites uh, in culture would be very important for, uh, for drug discovery and, and hopefully in the spinal cord injury area as well. And so we've now developed a way that people can thaw these cells and within a couple hours uh, get cells that start to extend uh, neurites. And these are normal human cells. They're not a transformed uh, cell line, uh, which is only available today. 
Um, you, they're amenable to high content, high throughput screening, and, and you can do all kinds of uh, image analysis uh, on these cells, and uh, again, for neurite uh, outgrowth and morphology. Um, again, uh, if you let these cultures uh, go out for uh, several weeks, you get nice extension of these uh, axons or dendritic processes, as well as growth cone formations <coughs> at the end. So uh, um, uh, axon guidance um, issues uh, can be addressed, I think, in, in vitro as a test bed uh, in the future. And they become, uh, over months, uh, uh, over weeks in culture, very complex uh, networks of cells. And I think this is going to be important, again, from a functional side of things in that uh, what we might be able to do is uh, with synaptic formation and spontaneous electrical activity be able to uh, monitor compounds that may be, again, neuroprotective as well as, as compounds that might speed this process and, and, uh, and add to neurogenesis. Uh, we, are, we do have a DOD grant um, that I think has many possibilities. Uh, the DOD has a lot of money, and so uh, I'd gladly take their money for uh, this activity in that uh, we're, their, their interest is that they'd like to be able to put human cells down on a uh, microelectrode array uh, in order to monitor uh, for neurotoxins and, and nerve agents in the theater or battlefield um, that they're talking about. And they've, they've developed a group at the Navy, uh, uh, Tom O'Shaughnessy has developed a basically a, a toolbox that you could put cells in and monitor the uh, spiking, the spontaneous activity of, of neural cells within it. And so uh, those neural uh, signals um, are great indicators that when you put in a neurotoxin that the amplitude and frequency of those, that spontaneous activity goes down. But uh, we think we can reformat this for drug discovery and working with a group at, at Georgia Tech uh, to develop assays that might screen compounds for pain. So a lot of uh, some of the assays that people are using today in the industry for pain is to be able to dampen um, the spontaneous electrical activity. And if we can do this in a higher throughput in a 96 well format, uh, we can uh, look at some of this spontaneous activity and dampen that with uh, if certain compounds uh, dampen that effect maybe in the next new leads for something like pain or other therapies in the future. Epilepsy is one as well. So I'm just going to conclude now and say that you know we have derived uh, neural progenitor cells from these human embryonic stem cells. They're consistent and mul for multiple passages. Um, when they're uh, when removed from the proliferative factors, they differentiate in the neural networks diverse cellular phenotypes. I didn't show you the data on the astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, but they're there. Uh, they demonstrate properties that are consistent with formation of functional connected ne networks. Um, you know, is the question at the end, is there a role for, for migrating neural progenitor cells that are responsive to differentiating factors and that do, and uh, if they don't form tumors in spinal cord injury? And so if we control, can control these cells in vitro, can we also control them in vivo and do the right thing uh, when they're transplanted? So um, I'm going to stop there uh, and answer, well, maybe not answer any questions, but uh, go from there. Oh, one last thing, sorry. Uh, got to put a plug in for our NIH workshop if you're interested in, in these cells as well as embryonic stem cells. Now I've got the wrong date now. We've got one in May, May 18th to the 22nd here at the University of Georgia. So thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, we have time for one or two questions. And of course, our challenge to Steve is to come up with what are the barriers to putting this back into people? Um, <laughs> and somebody else maybe to answer that question? <laughs> Yes. I actually have two questions, but I don't know if I'll be allowed to vote. But they're not entirely related. One is, um, you mentioned this bit about the teratomas depending on the cell source. I wondered if you would comment on how much you think that might be related to the 
growth cocktails. Uh, Edward and John tells me they're not going to use retinoic acid because they think that's a trigger for teratoma formation. So how much of it is the cells versus the yeah, the yeah. I think that's that's a big question. Uh, obviously, I can't um, answer. Uh, you know, I I can only say that when we put those cells back into the the mouse and for teratoma formation, they're not they they, they were not exposed either one of them to retinoic acid. So we got our response without a retinoic acid or a, a growth factor other than what's in proliferation of the embryonic stem cells, which is uh, um, uh, serum replacement, and uh, but it has growth factors in it, uh, like basic FGF and some of those things, and and the feeder cells may be contributing to that as well. But um, whether so, I don't really have an answer other than I can say that retinoic acid was not uh, a factor in our cells in forming different uh, teratomas. So I guess the second question is at the other end of the spectrum of this neural differentiation uh, into your of mature functional neurons. And we had uh, an R21 to study stromal cells from adipose. You could get them to look like neurons in cell culture and make neurotrophic factor receptors and neurotransmitters and, mm -hmm. and then grow in uh, multi-electrode arrays and never fire an action potential in a network and then intracellular recordings could never fire an action potential. So um, I know you mentioned at the end for your assays, but the ones that you're studying that you're hoping to get to mature, mature uh, neuronal phenotype, how, mm -hmm. what would your threshold be for characterizing they've made mature mm -hmm. neuronal threshold? And that, that's always a, an issue with the um, reviewers and people as well when you say functional and that's, uh, everybody has a different definition of that. Uh, we do know that embryonic stem cells can go to uh, forming synapses and they can fire action potentials in their synaptic uh, function there. Uh, we also know that other groups, uh, and we're trying to repeat that with our cells, have been able to get spontaneous activity on MEAs uh, with uh, human embryonic stem cells. Now the interesting uh, thing is that to date at least, um, the groups that I, I know of, and maybe people, other people can correct me, but um, to get to those functional uh, phenotypes, you need a, uh, either co-culture or condition media with an astrocyte uh, cell. So you need something that the astrocytes provide to get those functional characteristics. John? Um, you said that the military newer toxin detector was also valuable for what other purpose? Well, I, I think in the end, if, if uh, again, we can get uh, repeatable results on the, these MEAs with our cells, the MEAs microelectrode arrays um, that have multiple channels on them so you can basically monitor those spiking, uh, spontaneous spiking activity that uh, there are groups out there, pharmaceutical companies out there that are using rat cells and other cells from isolated from animals to monitor uh, that electrical activity and the effect of compounds on either increasing activity or decreasing activity. So for instance, pain, um, there is a group that would be interested in if you added a compound and you could eliminate those, that electrical activity um, with those compounds that it might prevent the, uh, you know, the, the firing and through action potentials uh, and through uh, ion channels. Of, uh, uh, for pain uh, area, so so that's that's just one application. So add a comp, you get spontaneous activity. Add a compound, you eliminate that activity. That might be a candidate for pain in the future. Do um, do the cells express telomerase, and when you induce differentiation, how quickly they if it express how quickly it goes down? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the telomerase uh, question is out there, and they do express. Um, the uh, um, other groups have shown their, uh, all of, all of Bristol's lab has shown that they've expressed as well. Um, so how, how, I guess the second question, how long does it take well, to get to... Well, you should to, to, they can differentiate nicely. I mean, yeah. Those so, differentiated so cells have 
So the cells that I was showing on the 96 war wall <coughs> format um, are, you know, two to three weeks out there and, and past uh, taking them off the proliferative stage. Now, if you want to get something that looks further out there as far as more mature, uh, that could take up to another three or to five weeks. To, to get that. So that, that is an issue when you're working with human cells, is that that internal clock um, is different than mouse cells. And it will take longer than, to do that. Peter, this last question. I just I did notice that you used the several different antibiotics in your culture. Mm, I mean, yeah, what, what's the yeah. purpose of that? Well, um, tradition. <laughs> uh, so the, that's what we've done. But we've also been able to use without antibiotics as well. So that was published uh, with a formula there. I know we have a question. Yeah. Um, 